Oh yeah, because then we can share it after. Okay, now you can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melanie Taylor Coombs. I am the Adult Services Manager at MacArthur Library, and we're very happy to be partnering with Diane Sear from the Biddeford Cultural and Heritage Center. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I always have to go B C H C in my head. <laughs> and we're very, very pleased to have Brian Schwartz here. And I'll also introduce my um, counterpart there, Danny, who is our teen librarian at MacArthur Library. So we've muted everybody, but if you have questions, please feel free to ask a question in the chat room, sort of wave at us, or you can actually do the thumbs up, if, you know, just get the idea that we have a question and then we'll pass it on to Brian. Um, and at the end, we'll give everybody an opportunity to unmute themselves and ask questions. And I will turn things over to Diane Sear without further ado. Hi, thanks, Melanie. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for attending tonight. I'm sorry that we had all these glitches with um, the site and all of that, but hopefully we um, you can all hear, I'm sorry, I keep saying um. I want to introduce to you Brian Schwartz, who is the author of a fairly new book called Maine at War, From Bladensburg to Sharpsburg. And he's here tonight to present with to us about um, the influence, the contributions of the state of Maine and the city of Biddeford in the area during the Civil War. He is a uh, resident of Brewer. He has worked with the Bangor Daily News for many, many years and currently writes a blog on the Civil War. And so I really don't know how to turn this over to Brian, but we are ready to go. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Diane. And Danny, this is where I go to the, t the uh, share screen, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, hold on, everybody. I just need to get this to All where right. we can see. Hello. Okay, the, appreciate everybody attending tonight. I hope we all learned something. I often do by the time I get done, even with one of my own programs. The uh, Civil War it would be one of those never ending stories if you ever wanted to um, become a Civil War buff and learn about it. There's if you're into it like I am, every time you open a book, there's a new tale. But tonight we're talking about Maine and Biddeford helped save the Union in 1861, 1862. I'm just focusing on the first two years of the war. The gentleman in front of you waving the, uh, or holding the 20th Maine Infantry flag, our company E reenactors from Maryland, Washington, DC, Northern Virginia. I photographed them at the uh, 150th anniversary of um, the Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg back in 2012. Uh, that was an interesting couple of days there down in Maryland. It's almost similar, but yet different to how the United States seems to be this year. Uh, by late 1850s, the uh, United States was badly divided. The issue that's dividing the country is slavery. But there is a major component to that aspect of slavery that really does not get mentioned. And this is the issue of political power. The um, Southern states until the 1850s have basically at least controlled the Senate because you know, you know, the, the rule is under the constitution, one state, two senators. And because of the way the constitution was formulated, the blacks of the South, regardless of slave or free, each is counted as uh, three fifths of a white man or a white person in terms of population and census. But the Southerners want to expand uh, slavery into the Western territories. We're talking Kansas westward, all the way to California, Oregon, um, up to the Canadian border. And the, the idea being is that if they can carve out a state or two or three out of the territories, they gain the requisite number of senators and remain in control of the Senate. The House is a different situation where that's admitted, where that's based on uh, population. Um, the uh, North is much more heavily populated than the South for reasons that to this day, I don't quite understand, but the uh, overall, the South has what you consider an agrarian society. The North is becoming heavily in industrialized 
and the North is also receiving the bulk of the immigrants. The, uh, you'll notice, excuse me here, I'm gonna admit, gentlemen here, the middle cartoon, this is actually a newspaper cartoon from circa 1860, depicts the North and South as a quarreling couple. Uncle Sam is the husband, the uh, housewife wearing the little apron was kind of in a Confederate flag uh, design. She's uh, given him a what to, and then the issue of slavery is trying to escape out the, either the back or front door. This is one of the few humorous references I've seen to this issue of a house divided. Hello. Okay, hold on folks. My computer has locked up. No, oh, no. What? This shouldn't be happening. Okay. This particular map, uh, whoops. This particular map is actually uh, was created in 1862. It's a, about a 50 meg map. It's available at the Maine State Library for a nice check, shall we say. They sell nothing inexpensively. As you can see, the map depicts the uh, state of Maine as we know it today. And if I could blow this up so you could focus just on the uh, Biddeford soccer area, you would realize that basically the at least the major, major roads, railroads, and towns of today were there then. Uh, the state's population, hold on just a second, I'm gonna. State's population, 1860, 628,279 people. That's a little bit less than 50% of what we have today. And that's an important number to remember. Most Mainers live uh, by the sea, by the rivers, by large streams, it's easier to travel on the water in the warmer weather. Um, you cannot trust frozen waterways in the winter time in terms of safe travel because there's always going to be a place in the ice that's thin and people are going to fall through and drown. And it did happen back then quite a bit. The Confederates, to their foolishness, opened fire on Fort Sumter, April 12, 1861. Major Robert Anderson commanded the garrison. He had already decided that because he was basically out of food, uh, his water was pretty bad anyways. He, if he was not resupplied by April 14th, he was going to surrender Fort Sumter, which in the imagery here you, you will see is three stories high. By the time the Union Navy got done taking apart during the uh, Civil War, it looks like the debris field that's there now. When the Confederates attack Fort Sumter, both the federal government and Maine are woefully unprepared to fight a war. Uh, wasn't really expected. The Republican Party was established nationally in the 1850s to oppose slavery. In the North, it has gained many adherents. And with the elections in the, from about the mid 1850s onwards, Republicans are now in charge in Augusta, both the state legislature and in the uh, governor's office. The 1861 governor is Israel Washburn Jr. He is one of the Washburns out of Livermore, Livermore Falls. His brother Elihu Washburn, who adds an E to his surname, he was an Illinois attorney and congressman and he was one of Abraham Lincoln's dearest friends. Uh, Washburn puts the state on a, a wartime footing. Uh, basically, the state changes direction politically 180 degrees over a period of two or three days. It's never been done since then in state history. His uh, adjutant general on the right is John L. Hodgson Jr. out of Bangor by way of Corinth. He is a very capable administrator, and he and his staff will administer the state's war effort through 1866. And one uh, goal that he will accomplish is to save so much in terms of records, letters, muster rolls, regimental reports, that among the loyal states, Maine has one of the, the uh, greatest 
uh, treasure troves of Civil War correspondence and records of any state. All available there at Augusta, much of now available online too. The War Department contacts Maine in mid-May, tells them we want 10 infantry regiments, a thousand men per regiment, we want them now. That's 10,000 men out of a population of 628,000. The state will borrow millions of dollars to recruit soldiers and arm, clothe, equip, and house them. What it did not mention was also to feed them. These soldiers, primarily younger men in their 20s and 30s, have voracious appetites. By December 31st, 1861, Maine will raise 15 infantry regiments, six artillery batteries, and one cavalry regiment, the 1st Maine Cavalry, and around 17,000 Mainers will enlist. These are the cream of the crop in terms of the patriots who are determined to save the Union. It's not to besmirch anybody coming after them, but these are the men who initially respond in a major burst of uh, patriotism. The photo of the upper right is an actual a Union artillery battery. I do believe their guns are, should be six of them, 12 pound uh, brass or bronze Napoleons. Biddeford will change with the war. It's going to change significantly. It already is. It's becoming an industrial center as textile mills now start to appear in Maine. The railroads are pushing deeper into the state's interior uh, Biddeford was on the first out-of-state line that was built. That's the Boston and Maine. And you have the Saco River there with the dams the, uh, that provided water power for the, like say the Pepperell Mill. The, the uh, postcard on the right is circa 1902, 1903. But the, it gives you an idea what the mill complexes looked like. On the left is the uh, is a lithograph showing a Boston and Maine train chugging north. Biddeford's on the left crossing the Saco River and Saco is on the right. And this ra railroad, this particular line in the city of Biddeford, will see hundreds if not thousands of trains related to the war coming and going through the next four years. Biddeford is one of Maine's oldest towns. It was incorporated in July, 1653 and became a city on February 10th, 1855. This image at uh, I lifted from Wikipedia of the City Hall and its clock tower. It says this is circa 1855, but the uh, utility poles and the wires tell me this has got to be later because there's definitely electricity in those lines. The, populate, the city's population increases from about 2000 to 1830, 6,100 uh, 6, in 1850, to almost 9,400 in 1860. Massive growth um, by the end of the 1850s, early 1860s, people are coming to Biddeford and Stockholm to work, a lot of them in the mills, a lot of them in jobs with businesses that are supplying material to the mills. Many of these people are drawn from the Southern Maine countryside. Others are immigrants. There is still a cresting wave of Irish immigration into Maine at this time. And what you're also seeing are many uh, Canadians coming across from New Brunswick and to a lesser extent of Nova Scotia. They're looking for work. Uh, the Maritimes then as they are today are not exactly the, have the most booming economy in Canada. And so in Biddeford and in all of Maine, the war will spur business and textile manufacturing is high on that list. On the left is the page two from the April 19th, 1861 edition of the Union in, uh, Journal, published in Biddeford by Lewis O. Cowan, or Cohen, uh, sounds like an Irish surname. This is his first issue after the attack on Fort Sumter. And in the right column, you will see a typical hodgepodge of headlines that the Maine and American media will print in many editions before the war ends. In order to get its 10 regiments, what Maine does is calls up militia companies, uh, forms what it can uh, of them into regiments, also recruits uh, other men to fill out the ranks. According to the um, Maine Agent General's report for 1861, there were four Biddeford men that joined the 1st Maine Infantry Regiment, which is basically formed from militia companies in Portland, 
in Lewiston and Auburn. Uh, George S. Cobb is a machinist. George S. Credifer is a mechanic. John Pillsbury is a machinist. Those three men probably are working in local mills. Joseph M. Smith is a shoemaker. His residence is listed as Portland, but he was definitely was credited, excuse me, to Biddeford as one of its enlistees. Now the map on the left is uh, taken from that 1862 map of Maine. This again shows you how high resolution that map is. You can clearly see Biddeford in the lower left, Saco upper right. And I'm sure most of those streets are still existing and many will still have the same names. Biddeford by war's end is going to send an incredible 924 men to join the army. Um, you can argue that's about 10% of the city's population. Some of these men will come from other communities. They might be an Irish immigrant, might be a Canadian, but they will be credited to Biddeford. And actually that's 14.9%, call it 15%, of the 6,200 recruits and draftees that are credited to York County. That is an incredibly high percentage. Uh, only Bangor, Lewiston, maybe Portland are going to come close to that. The one town that has the highest percentage of men in its population that joined the, uh, the war efforts, the town of Sherman, way up in northern Penobscot County, they have close to 100% uh, turnout rate among their men. Uh, joining primarily the Army. Other Biddeford men will serve in the Navy or they will serve in other states' regiments. A lot of Maine men either were living out of state or for some reason they decided to join like Massachusetts regiments in particular. Now we're going to meet one or two of the Biddeford men. And I titled this, What Are the Odds? James Nason, he's 20. He works as an operative, sounds like a spy. He mustered with the 5th Maine in late June, 1861. This is primarily a Lewiston regiment. He stands 5'5", and he has brown eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion, and he's single. This information is available on his soldier's files at Augusta. He fights at First Manassas. This is a newspaper woodcut on the right. And the 5th Maine really gets shellac there. Um, not through any fault of their own. It's gross mishandling by the Union generals. What else is new throughout the war? Anyways, he's medically discharged on October 3rd in 1861 and comes home. Then James Nason, 19, joins the 5th Maine Battery on October 19th, 1861 and musters in Augusta on December 4th. Again, same name. He's 19, he stands 5'5", five five, he has hazel eyes and brown hair, but he has what's called a dark complexion. He's married and he claims he works as a farmer. And admittedly, his complexion would suggest that he's got a farmer's tan. So you got two James Nasons, uh, supposedly one year apart. They're both 5'5", five five, have hazel eyes, which could pass for brown and brown hair. The only difference is the complexion color and the marital status, but that could have been changed in those 16 days in October. Anyways, he serves with the uh, 5th Maine Battery through several battles in 1862. And as the fighting rages at Chancellorsville on Sunday, May 3rd, 1863, the 5th Maine Battery is, is brought up on limbers near the Chancellor House. This uh, photo on the left, the ruins of the, is at that site. Chancellor House, which was destroyed during the battle, is off to the left of this picture a little bit, but this is the heart of where the 5th Maine Battery was. The Confederates have at least 30 artillery pieces zeroed in on the Maine boys on the nearby Irish Brigade, which was providing their infantry support. And Confederate troops are moving up, for, especially from the south, which is the tree line in the distance. And they're now shooting at the Maine boys. Every horse in the battery goes down. The uh, Confederate artillery destroys the 5th Maine. And before the, uh, the guns can be withdrawn, there are only two gunners are left. 
and they're working a single, single 12 pounder Napoleon. It's a tragic story. It's a heroic story. Unfortunately for our hero, James Nason, it's a fatal story because he was killed in action that day. Very sad. Left behind a widow in Bitterford. 1861, uh, that November, December, at least nine Bitterford men joined the 1st Maine Cavalry. It's one of my favorite Maine regiments. Um, what was great about the Cavalry, it's new, it's exciting, and the Cavalrymen didn't have to walk. They rode everywhere, whereas the infantrymen walked. Harking back to the Union and Journal newspaper, publisher Lewis O. Cohen, musters were the first main cavalry on Halloween, literally on Halloween, 1861. And he resigns 30 days later, classic call it 31, be nice to him, uh, for reasons unknown. So he is in the military for one month, long enough to claim that I was a uh, cavalry officer in the Civil War, but officers could resign their commissions and enlisted men could not, and if they tried to walk away, they could be charged with desertion, and occasionally one of our two of them would get shot for deserting. Another Bitterford soldier is John R. Andrews. He's a 20-year-old clerk. He enlists as a private in the 1st Maine Cavalry, and he will muster out three years later as a first lieutenant. Talented enlisted men, and I guess you could say talented junior officers, could move up. Once the war became serious in 1862, starting with the Peninsula Campaign, uh, vacancies became more common. Officers got shot. Uh, the NCOs got shot. Many died of disease. Uh, a few disappeared. Some sad stories there from other towns. Unfortunately, then we have Benjamin G. Hawks. I love the spelling of his last name. It's a 25-year-old Mason. He was so talented, probably could read and write, and had a aura of leadership about him. He became the first sergeant in Company F of the 1st Maine Cavalry. He is killed in action during the June 19th, 1863 Battle of Middleburg, Virginia. That was the battle that was preceded the day before by the Battle at Aldi, where the regiment's Colonel, uh, Colonel Dowdy, Calvin Dowdy from Dover Foxcroft was killed. And Hawks's name is recorded on a first Maine Cavalry monument that was dedicated at Middleburg um, about 15 months ago. So he's at least etched in memory. Among the other soldiers from Biddeford, and again, I've chosen several, this is again from 1861, 1862, Elbridge G. Johnson is married and he works as a manufacturer. Again, these terms, I've not been able to determine what they all mean. He was at the 1st Main Cavalry. He served at Gettysburg. He was on detached duty, which meant either he was a courier or was some general's, uh, in some general's cavalry guard. And later in the war, he transferred to the 1st Main Veteran Volunteers as the um, first three-year regiments from Maine were seeing their enlistments end in early 1864, up through that June and July, the War Department formed the first Maine Veteran Volunteers and offered these veterans um, a nice financial bonus, a 30-day home leave, and a chance to maybe at least pin on another stripe or whatever if they would join the Veteran Volunteers. Many did, many liked the uh, military life, Many Maine boys wanted to stay through and see the war to its successful conclusion. This is evident from their letters home. Uh, unfortunately, of the Maine boys that joined this particular outfit, the uh, regiment will fight with Phil Sheridan in the, in the Valley Campaign in autumn 1864, and many of them are going to either be killed or wounded. Ezra W. Leland is a 20-year-old machinist. He joins the 3rd Maine Infantry, this was considered the Kennebec Valley Regiment. It was raised with um, militia companies from Bath all the way up to Augusta and points beyond, like the 1st Maine Cavalry and the 5th Maine Infantry mustered at um, Augusta. He fought at 1st Manassas and on the peninsula, and he survived. He was able to go home with a medical discharge in December 1862. There is the impression 
in the uh, regimental rules that he got sick. And that was a, a common problem with soldiers on both sides. Disease was a great killer of men in the camps. He came home, but again, he did survive. And then the, the two gentlemen shooting the little mountain howitzer on the lower left, that was here in Bangor at an encampment a few years ago. William D. Patterson, he's a 19-year-old sailor. He joined the first main battery in mid-December 1861. Why a sailor would join the artillery, he never told anybody. That regiment was the first one to leave, battery, excuse me, was the first one to leave Maine. They went to what's considered the Department of the Gulf, which is primarily Louisiana, Alabama, Missouri, Panhandle of Florida. He served in Louisiana. Unfortunately, he died there of disease on May 12, 1863. The main regiments, and there were many that went to Louisiana and the lower Mississippi Valley, a disease was rampant in killing the boys from up north. They just were shocked at um, the, different, the change in the climate, but also the bugs, the poisonous snakes. Again, the dysentery, the typhoid fever, yellow fever. Uh, if a man could get sick with something, could kill him, especially what happened in Louisiana. There is one character here who has question marks, should be all around his name, from Biddeford or Beantown. Uh, James Warren is credited to Biddeford. He must have at one point have lived in the city, but for some reason he's over on the mid coast in the Rockland area in spring 1861 and he joins the 4th Maine Infantry as a musician. But his main soldier's file lists Boston as his place of residence and he's born in New Hampshire. I have not been able to make the Biddeford connection, but again, the state does officially credit him to Biddeford and that's the state records got to be correct. Correct. Again, he's 5'5". Five five. He has black eyes, brown hair, and a dark complexion. This would strongly suggest that he works outside. He fights at Manassas below. You can see another woodcut from the first battle. And on the right, it's a photo of mine from the battlefield there showing the wind blowing the, uh, the hay or the wheat on a beautiful June afternoon. And he receives an honorable discharge in January 1863. But his soldier's file has this unusual notation uh, written in hand, not regularly mustered, name not on original file. But he does have a soldier's file in Augusta. And again, that qualifies him as being from Maine. Biddeford will end the war, proud of what her sons and daughters have accomplished. I want to stress the, the role of the uh, women of the city, the women of Maine in general. In Biddeford, specifically, many local women will join a ladies' aid society. It was also called a soldiers' aid society. Uh, both names were common in whatever towns or cities women decided to get together and do what they could to support the soldiers. This meant providing clothing, often homemade, uh, sewing machines. Many uh, wealthier women had sewing machines at the time. They were hand portable, not like the heavy ones you would see today. Uh, the women especially would provide the uh, soldiers from Maine with Maine food stables, potatoes, dried apples, fresh apples, if they could get them down there in time in the fall, you name it. They would send it. They would send everything else that soldiers could use, beg for, uh, small New Testament, small Bibles, letters. The soldiers ranged in age, we're going to see that in a few minutes, from supposedly 17 to age 45. But their ages are running actually from 15 up until the recently I've come across a soldier who may have been 62. And there are references, I believe, with the 20th Maine of a man in his mid-50s with white or gray hair that dyed his hair black and mustered in with the 20th Maine in August 1862. And the uh, author of the history who was involved with the 20th Maine comments that the longer the soldier was in, on duty that fall and winter, the more his roots showed light colored. 
and the 55 year old man stayed in the, with the regiment for quite a while. The uh, single men are lonely. Um, the married men or the boys, you know, the sons, grandsons, the brothers, they're missing their ladies, they're missing their women, the mothers, the sisters, again, the grandmothers, um, sweethearts. And oftentimes uh, in these ladies' age societies, the uh, women, particularly the younger ones who are single, will take up writing letters to soldiers, almost like you could have, I suppose, during any war the United States has been involved in since then. Once the war is over, Biddeford erects it's the war monument in June, 1887. And that monument of course is still there. I photographed probably 90 to 92% of the monuments in Maine. And this is the one that I still need to photograph. The city unfortunately comes out of the war broke. What happened from 1862 onwards is that there's so much competition for men to either join new regiments or to join existing regiments that main towns and cities now need to start spending money to pay what's called recruiting bounties. It's basically a bribe to lure a man into signing up in your town or city. So that way you get credited hit with his name. And maybe you can avoid having to draft some of your uh, residents who are very reluctant to join the military and send them off. Bitterford will raise about $145,500 for bounties. This does not include what the city will spend uh, financially to support soldiers' families. The Maine legislature in early in the war passed a law mandating that Maine municipalities will support soldiers' families when they request assistance. Uh, not all Maine towns and cities did. Um, the town of Cutler way down in Washington County had some serious issues, uh, basically told its soldiers, wives or grandmothers, whomever these women were dependent upon for their financial support. Well, you've got to go on the paupers rolls first and these uh, Washington County women were too proud. They'd rather starve than uh, be declared paupers. Anyways, that $145,500, that's the equivalent of about 2.3 million today. This is money spent again that um, the city will never see, but it has to be paid back with interest. The War Department has determined that in the loyal states, men between the ages of 17 and 40 are eligible for military service. And according to the War Department, based on the 1860 census, federal government was quite good in its bureaucracy even then. There are 112,466 men in this age range living in Maine. And of that number, some 73,000 will join the Army or Navy. And these figures are based on uh, what the Maine State Archives has provided me. This figure of 73,000 men represents 11.5% of Maine's population. There is a caveat that many of these men are from the Maritimes, a few from Quebec, uh, some from other states. I've seen New Yorkers, New Hampshire, guys, a few English, some Germans, a few French, uh, some from Vermont, a few up from Massachusetts. So not all these 73,000 men are, are from Maine. Correspondingly, I suspect um, they are smaller in number than the number of Mainers who were actually served in other, re other states' regiments, that including the black Mainers who enlisted from 1863 onwards except for a few that were taken into what's called uh, white state regiments against all regulations, but Maine was, at least the 8th and 9th Maine Infantry were quite liberal in accepting um, both Indian and black recruits. Most of these black Mainers went to out of state regiments that were like the 54th Massachusetts, which were black regiments. The Maine State Archives has accounted for 9,398 9 men of that 73,000, almost 13% of them, who died of combat or diseases or other causes. There's murders, there's suicides. Five of them were shot uh, by firing squads. Uh, 
maybe all but one for desertion. I think one was shot for murder. But between her dead and wounded, Maine will suffer the highest per capita loss rate of any of the loyal states. Again, this is in a population of 628,000 people. If Maine were to attempt to recruit 11.5% of its population into the military today for a national emergency, we'd be looking at somewhere around 143,000 to 150,000 Mainers. Uh, I believe it could not be done. Diane had mentioned my book earlier. I'll maybe fill you in a little bit my background. I grew up in the Brewers and in the Brewer schools during the Civil War Centennial 1960s and got hooked on the war. The fact that I learned from my dad who was from Virginia that we had a pile of Confederate ancestors didn't deter me from wanting to learn about the war. So in April 2011, while I was working as an editor at Bangor Daily News, I started writing the column Maine at War this became a weekly blog in March, 2012, and I still publish it to this day and uh, have somewhere closing up on 500 different posts by now. But 2014, based drawing on the soldiers' letters, diaries, memoirs, and newspaper articles, regimental correspondence and reports, I started a, and the official records, which are not always accurate. I started, I wrote my first volume of three volume series, Main at War, volume one, Bladensburg and Sharpsburg. And this follows the uh, Mainers, both men and women, who are involved in the first 18 months of the war. You basically have to take January, February, March, 1861 out because that was, they weren't shooting yet. And um, Mainers really, particularly the politicians really didn't believe there's going to be a shooting war. So they were not prepared for one. In volume one, I introduced many Mainers. Um, the recruits came in from all over the Pine Tree State that spring, summer, and fall. Uh, you can go all the way up to St. John Valley, all the way down to Kittery, all the way over to Callis or Eastport, then west over to uh, Bethel, Gilead, uh, the Maine boys. I use the term boys. So many of them were men, and if they weren't, they became men very quickly. The, the, the term boys is something that you will find in the correspondence is how they often referred to themselves, or I mean, I should say their friends, their companions. The officers, if they cared for their men, not all did, would refer to their men as my boys or the boys. Um, among the three characters, three of the characters I've introduced in the book, on the left is Ira Gardner. He's a, a teenager from Patton. Very quickly, he was 18, the oldest of four. He had three younger sisters. He wanted to join the war early in the summer and early fall of 1861. His dad said, no, you're going to stay here on the farm and help with the harvest. But like any teenager who wants something, he wheedled, whined, and I suspect probably harassed his sisters until they begged their parents to be, please kick him out of the house. So his parents said, yeah, you can join the war effort. He joined the 14th Maine Infantry, stayed in the war until the end and beyond and uh, lost an arm in defending the United States. In the center is a bank clerk, John Mead Gould from uh, Portland, very unique character. He joined the first Maine, which became the 10th Maine, which became the 29th Maine. So essentially, except for when he's home during the periods between the next regiment that the uh, prior mansion regiment will morph into, He's in the war from April 1861 until 1866, because the 29th Maine will go south on occupation duty. And he left a very detailed diary. He's literate, he's observant, he's a very caring individual, um, incredibly brave. The gentleman on the right, the older fellow, he's actually middle-aged, his name is Elijah Walker. He was a merchant in Rockland, in partnership with Hiram Berry. Berry's importance is that he was the first colonel, the 4th Maine Infantry Regiment, and he was the highest ranking Maine general to be killed in action during the war. Uh, he was killed at Chancellorsville. Elijah Walker becomes a captain in the 4th Maine, and within 11 months or so, he is the colonel 
and he will stay in until the regiment disbands in June or July 1864. If you've been to Gettysburg and you've been to the uh, Little Round Top, no, excuse me, not Little Round Top, the Devil's Den area, the fourth main monument is on a monolith, is on one of the boulders down by the uh, road. And if you walk around the uh, Devil's Den, that was the fourth main's uh, action station late afternoon, the evening of April, excuse me, July 2nd, 1863. But there were the ladies in the first of its kind, I believe, in the United States. The Maine legislature in April 1861 passed a law authorizing Maine women to volunteer as nurses and to accompany various regiments off to war. Sarah Sampson on the left was married to uh, a gentleman who was a, a carved ship's head, which makes, you know, the, the colorful uh, decorations on the bowels of sailing ships and bath. Her husband was a captain, a company captain, later became Lieutenant Colonel of the Third Maine. But when that regiment went to war, probably early June, 1861, she went with it, except for a few uh, months spent occasionally back home in Bath. She was in the field with her boys, as she called them, uh, caring for the Third Maine boys in any manner she could find, any hospital, any battlefield that she was at. Um, truly heroic woman. She uh, died. She died in Washington, D.C., where she'd been working as a government employee long after the war. The members of the Third Maine Infantry Association strongly lobbied the Maine congressional delegation. And Sarah Sampson was buried with the heroes at Arlington National Cemetery. She's still there. Um, Isabella Fogg on the right. She was a widow and a seamstress. She was from, uh, born in New Brunswick. We won't hold that against her. Uh, her son, Hugh, may have been her only surviving child, joined the six month, six main infantry out of Callis. So she became a nurse and followed him off to war. And she basically, again, except for a very few months spent back in Maine, she was in the thick of the action, sometimes under fire. Uh, so was Sarah Sampson. She was, she records that she was during the withdrawal from the Peninsula campaign. She was on a hospital transport on the James River that Confederate cavalry pulled up with their horse artillery on the Confederate held shore, opened fire on the transport and nailed the um, pile house, wounded the, the uh, skipper. Um, she was unharmed. Unfortunately for Isabella Fogg, late in the war, she was out in Cincinnati, uh, assigned to field hospitals out there and one night while crossing the deck of a, I'm told it was a barge that was transporting Union wounded, she fell through an open hatch, hurt her back. When she applied for a pension among the Union notaries who were notables, who signed her pension letter and her request a few years later for her increase in pension with Joshua Chamberlain and Ulysses Simpson Grant, they both knew her very well. And then this is my um, business card. Um, I have, again, I invite you, when you, you're interested to log on to the uh, blog site. I'll be publishing another new uh, blog post tomorrow. And I'm going to return, stop sharing, and take this back to Danny. All right, let me just unspotlight your video. Thank you. And I'm willing to an answer questions if I can. And All right, so everybody should now have the ability to unmute yourself. If you have a question to ask, you are welcome to unmute yourself or you are welcome to type your question in the chat and I will read it off. Any questions? I, I just wanted to say thank you, Brian. Well, thank you. That was really interesting and very, very, very good. I'm sorry that... Um, 
we weren't able to do it with COVID, you know, in, in public, but maybe in the future, if things clear out. Uh, do you, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna ask if you had any idea of how many, if there were any Canadians or people, if you knew of any. Oh my goodness, the Canadians were, again, New Brunswick, lesser extent, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, they came in numbers. Um, one kind of humorous incident that I didn't mention was that in spring 1861, Maine basically has some old firearms for its militiamen in order to try to get some modern firearms. And I mentioned in my book, to detail it, Governor Washburn sent a secret agent to New Brunswick and Halifax with the mission of wherever there's a British military garrison, Royal Army, not, not the Canadian militia, you know, check out the bars where these uh, soldiers hang out, and particularly with the Irish, let them know that um, Maine is paying X number of dollars. If you want to come across the border and sign up in a Maine regiment, and if you bring your rifled musket with you, you're going to get make a lot more money. In fact, the problem that I've seen with the Royal Army deserters, they would come across the border, sign up join the regiment, maybe muster in and go off to war. But as soon as they had the chance to desert, they would. Oh. There's a the 16th Maine Infantry. There's a story told in their memoirs of two British and two Royal Army deserters as the regiment is moving across uh, Northern Virginia. Oh, September, I'll say October um, 1862. These guys asked permission to go off and pick some berries. The main boys, being who they were, primarily farmers, if they found a patch of, of blackberries, raspberries, whatever, you could see half a regiment just disappear into the berry patch and start picking. Well, these two characters from the Royal Army, the notation is made is that uh, apparently they found their berry patch and basically must have been kept picking all the way to Canada or something because they were never seen again. And uh, then a couple of days later, another Royal Army deserter disappeared. But many of the Canadians uh, that joined Maine regiments or artillery batteries, they fought and died for the United States. Um, many of the immigrants did. I mean, there were many Irishmen that um, Germans, again, a few French, very few English that were, might've even come in through Portland for all I know. And you know, if, you're, if you're an Irish immigrant arriving in Portland anytime during the war and given the certain, the, being given the way that the Irish are being treated by the English at home, you're not gonna have any money. So a recruiting bounty of several hundred dollars being paid by let's say Biddeford, the state and the federal government that could draw you into military service. Thank you. The Irish, they were characters into themselves. But, so, um, I'm going to jump around in the questions a little bit because there's one that's kind of related to um, that topic. Um, Dan says, I just finished the biography of Thomas Meagher, who led the Irish Bra mm -hmm. Brigade. <laughs> Are you aware of any main men serving in that brigade? His name was Tom. It's actually pronounced Mar. Um, I understand M-E-A-G-H-E-R. I always pronounce it Mager, but I was recently uh, corrected by um, a Civil War buff who's you know really into the Irish Brigades, Thomas Tom Thomas Marr. I am not directly aware, but one of the regiments I, was from Massachusetts, and I would not be surprised there were probably a couple of Maine boys in there. Again, if you arrive from Ireland. Early in the war, the Irish Brigade is almost non-existent after they're just apparently basically destroyed in the first day at um, and the second day at Gettysburg. But if you're arriving in Portland and news of all sorts always coming into Portland, you hear there's a regiment of Irishmen recruiting in Massachusetts. Well, it's easy to hop the Boston, Maine down to North Station and you can sign up and all of a sudden if you're a private, you're making 13 bucks a month compared to what the English would let you take home for pay in Ireland, you're almost fabulously wealthy. 
So I, I'm, I don't know of any for sure, but I do know there are Irishmen that served in Maine regiments. And I see there's a question about Maine men as prisoners of war. Um, hundreds if not thousands of Maine boys were captured during the war. Uh, if you ever have a chance to read what happened, or should I say, read a on the sacrifice of the 16th Maine Infantry Regiment the first day at Gettysburg, July 1st, 1863. Uh, it's one example. Many of the Maine boys died in Confederate prisons. Um, it, was very, it was very odd as to who the Confederates would exchange and who wasn't. The exchange was set up so that if you're a private, they're going to trade you for another a, a captured private. If you're a general, they're going to trade you for a general. But if you're a general, you're probably, at least until 18, late 1863, you're going to be treated pretty well. The common enlisted men on both, I will stress, this is on both sides, will go into wretched prisoner of war camps. And as the war progresses, particularly among the main boys, the death rate for those who are incarcerated in Southern prisoners will rise. Not just the Mainers, but it's, it's the uh, Union prisoners anywhere. Um, ironically, the North and some of its um, prisons, Point Lookout on the Delmarva Peninsula, the one at Elmira, New York, it was actually a prisoner, the Confederates called the Hellmira. There's a book just came out about it. Uh, the death rates for the Confederates in, many, in some of those prisons, at least, will be almost rival what uh, Union boys were experiencing. There are many Union boys buried at Andersonville in the wartime prison. And this is the only prison I have found so far, at least on the southern side, where a photographer actually went in, southern photographer, photographed the uh, Union prisoners that there were within the stockade. And then he went out and photographed some of the, the prisoners being buried. They were buried in order of death, obviously. And there was a Union prisoner who was a clerk. He kept uh, death records, tried to identify you know, by number, assigned to each of the Union boys what his name was and his outfit. One of the photos taken looking down the death trench, the body that's going into the trench, is a mean boy. It's, I came across that, um, I believe it might be in the National Archives of Library of Congress, and I was stunned. There are other photos of, of Maine boys who were, um, came out of the Confederate prisons as emaciated skeletons. They would do justice this Halloween, frightening people. The, so the Mainers, um, so many went into prison, never came home again. Or if they came home, they didn't live long afterwards. Um, gonna, there's a question, the, uh, the role of the mills and textile industry in the war. The federal government towards the end of the war, I've seen figures of spending anywhere from $3 million to $6 million a day by early 1865 to wage the war. And this is when the army was at its largest, same with the Navy. The textiles were providing the clothing for the uniforms, blankets for the men, Blankets, saddle blankets for the horses. I would not have wanted to have been a horse anywhere near the war zone on either side during the Civil War because the hundreds of thousands of them were killed. Um, well, the textile industry in Maine and in New England really took off during the war. It gave Maine the, the um, infrastructure and the training in terms of employees and managers so when the mills, the war, when the war ends, the government says all contracts are torn up. So the mills suddenly find themselves without government work, but they were able to quickly shift to um, private work. As the, the soldiers returning from the war, they're used to this woven cloth. They like the blankets. Boy, do they like the blankets. They like the raincoats, such as they were. Um, and as they return to civilian society, uh, if they can afford it, they're going to be buying as good quality. Early on, the tax, some of the certain textile manufacturers, I can't say it occurred in Maine, uh, made what was called a shoddy material, S-H-O-D-D-Y. 
That's where we get the term shoddy from. It was considered a, a legitimate cloth, but basically what you would do is at night after the mills had closed down, your cleanup crew would come through and they would sweep up all the scraps of cloth into a bin. It would get kind of reworked a little bit and then sewed into shoes, socks, underwear, uniforms. But what the soldiers, especially with the 10th Maine Infantry found out um, the winter of 1861, 1862, when you're out marching across Maryland and all of a sudden it starts raining, your clothing dissolves and your shoes become nothing more than just a mass of glue because they're made out of what's called shoddy material. Uh, other questions, um, Thomas Marr. And there's a question of any slaves from Maine or those of color who served. Yes, I can very much answer that one. Maine had a small um, black population. Portland was one concentration. There was another one out in Warren. Um, a lot of those families were related to each other. And what happened after the Emancipation Proclamation starting in winter, spring, summer of 1863, when the army finally got its act together and started uh, enlisting black recruits, a lot of these black uh, main men signed up. I have photocopies of some of their recruiting records, the ones from Warren. One of them was, looked so young apparently, his father traveled with him to Augusta in the middle of uh, December, 1863 and um, sign an affidavit, yes, my son is 17. I mean, that leaves the implication the boy looked significantly younger. I mentioned earlier that most of these Maine men went to out-of-state regiments, including some from Rhode Island, that were created specifically for black recruits. However, at least a few of these, these black men from Maine ended up in the 8th Maine Infantry, I believe somewhere in the 9th Maine, and the ones in the 8th Maine, it's no questions asked when you looked at the soldiers' files, they're black. The War Department stipulated that no black enlisted men could serve in a white regiment, either federal or state. But obviously in these, at least a couple of these main regiments, the officers didn't care. And there are records of a couple of the main regiments that went off to Louisiana. They were losing so many uh, men, that's not funny, excuse me, losing so many men to disease and death, they started recruiting anybody who would sign up in um, Louisiana. And what would happen there is that slaves would flee the plantations, many of them run by Cajuns, would reach Union lines. And if they reached a main regiment, it was a case of raise your right hand, so do solemnly swear, you are now in the United States Army, such and such main regiment. In fact, there, I wrote a blog post about a year ago of a slave owner in New Orleans, found out his slave had joined, might've been the 14th Maine, maybe the 13th, and got permission from Ben Butler to have the slave returned. Now again, this is, this is the Emancipation Proclamation is in effect and the slave had reached union held territory, he's free. Well, Butler really came down on the regimental colonel, says, I expect that slave here pronto. And the colonel's response, if you read between the lines is, we looked, we can't find him. But by then they'd already hustled him upriver to um, some remote outpost that the regiment was holding, probably a company. And he kind of just disappeared into the main ranks. Uh, Maine Indians also signed up, um, at least the Penobscots. I cannot speak to the Passamaquoddies, but I would assume they probably did. And again, the 8th Maine Infantry took the Penobscots and uh, they served along with everybody else. The, um, there again, there are warning slaves from Maine, but there were slaves down south that if they reached Union lines and if they could reach again, and particularly in Mississippi Valley, if they fell in with a Maine regiment, if they wanted to, they were sworn in. There's one named Samuel Guess, G-U-E-S-S. -S. He joined the main regiment, uh, made friends with some white soldiers from Bangor, came to Bangor after the war, married a black woman, raised the family over on 14th Street. The house still stands. They're all buried up at Mount Hope Cemetery. And they were well known for, I guess they're quite musical. 
and they would hire out as entertainment to um, banquets, particularly uh, GAR events and regimental reunions in Bangor, because they knew the, you know, the Civil War music that the uh, soldiers liked to hear. And was there a naval service ever based on geography and, and were there main ships like main regiments? The answer to that question is no. However, there were gunboats specifically built in Maine, Portland, especially Kittery and elsewhere during the war with the assignment of being stationed uh, on the Maine coast. The Confederates, uh, their Navy raised for its limited number of what's called cruisers. I guess you call them a, a warship. They might've been the equivalent of their destroyers of the day. They raised havoc on the Yankees, on the Union Merchant Marine Fleet. They particularly destroyed Maine's Merchant Marine Fleet. Uh, the state had probably the greatest number of American flagged ships, commercial ships prior to the war, especially sailing ships, some steamers, had the highest percentage of uh, merchant marine skippers and any main boy living on the coast if he didn't ship as a sailor for at least a while prior to the war um, he might not be might not want to come home you ha might have to hang his head in shame so a lot of main men did serve in the navy if any of you have ever if you're familiar with the story of the confederate submarine css hunley sinking the union the union warship uss who's tonic off charleston the duty officer on deck that spotted the Hunley approaching in the dark was from Maine. <laughs> he got sunk then, he was, got torpedoed, and then about a year later, he was holding the same position basically on a steamship, it was actually an Admiral's flagship, um, moving along the inland, one of the inland waterways, I'm gonna say the South Carolina or Virginia. Well, the Confederates had planted a mine in it and it blew the bottom out of the steamer and sunk it right there in the waterway. And he survived that too. He didn't. He was kind of a hard luck case. But many Mainers served, if you were a main civilian sailor and you joined, um, if you were an officer, you would be named either an acting ensign. If you were really good, you might be named an acting lieutenant. The uh, regular Navy officers, as to this day, no, I should say less so today, wanted to ensure that nobody mistook a very talented, and capable civilian volunteer for a regular naval officer. They made sure, that's why you had the title acting and you never rose above lieutenant. Um, there were main sailors, volunteers, acting lieutenants who did command small steamers, particularly down the Gulf Coast in the inland waterways there, Virginia, not excuse me, Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama but you're not gonna see one of them commanding an ironclad or a major um, federal steam warship. And um, the Naval service was not based on geography. One thing I do wanna mention that as the war wore on and the Navy exploded in size is that the Navy ran out of recruits. So by the spring or late winter, early spring, 1864, and in through that summer, even though Grant needed every able-bodied soldier he could kill or wounded for kill a wound for his overland campaign, the War Department uh, passed the word to these particularly infantry regiments that if you have men who want to join the Navy, let them go. And so you in that 1864 period, you see a, a literal stampede of Mainers coming out of the infantry regiments and joining the Navy because they know the, the worst is going to happen. They're going to be assigned to some warship that's on blockading duty, just shifting back and forth all day with the tides and keeping an eye on the port and looking for blockade runners. They're not going to be marching off to battle. They're not going to die of disease because the Navy took much better care of its um, military personnel than the Army did in the early part of the war. The Navy, you know, they'd been long accustomed to scurvy, which was something that the Army had to learn about all over during the first two or three years of the war, as incredible as it might seem. Um, I think that's, I think I've answered the questions I'm seeing here in the chat room. Is there anybody else? 
feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or feel free to type it in the chat. Either one works. I, if you don't mind me making a plug for my main at War Volume 1 book, it is available online at Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, which I, I keep hearing is going to fold one of these days, but I'm not sure if it does. Um, unfortunately, I cannot speak in person anywhere, bring it with me. I am working far into volume two and I've actually written parts of volume three also. Uh, the Mainers who left home, men and women to save the union throughout the war, they were a tough people. They were a tough breed. Um, so Dan just soldiers. asked another question too. Yes. Uh, Dan wants to know when the last Maine Civil War veteran passed on. I'm going to say, and I just read this two weeks ago, 1947 or 1948, there were two. One was named Jellison from Clifton. I think he was with the 6th Maine. The other one was from down Southern Maine way, and they died just a few months apart. In fact, both of them were the last representatives of their respective GAR post. So shortly after World War II. Now the, the last widow of a Civil War veteran just died within the last several months in Virginia. You're asking how the heck did that happen? Her husband was in his mid to late 60s when he married this teenage girl she was either wife number three or wife number four and I I guess he was quite the elderly gent because they had several children and I actually wrote about her about three years ago she was receiving some kind of award down there and she was living in the Virginia Peninsula as being the last of the southern widows and they're also union widows were long gone so she actually made it into the 21st century. And like I said, she, with that elderly husband, she had a pile of children. There's a story there that I don't dare venture into. There, there's so many stories that I, I could spend another lifetime writing about it and I still wouldn't even scratch the surface. And any other questions? I do want to thank it, all of you for um, attending tonight has been my pleasure, my very great pleasure. I always enjoy talking about the Civil War with other Mainers. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Yes, thank you very much. And if you check out my blog post, you'll find my email address. Don't ever hesitate to send me a question if you have one. And we'll be posting um, a link to today's recording um, in the MacArthur Library YouTube channel and send it to Brian as well. So feel free to cross post that on your blog if you want. And if you have any questions, reach out. Okay. Again, thank, thank you, you everybody. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, and Melanie and Danny. I really appreciate it. It's made it possible. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll, well. Get, we'll keep in touch. All right. Sounds good. I have a real good program about Joshua Chamberlain. That, oh, uh, that'd be great. That, that would be good for another time. I mean, and it covers his war years and goes into areas that some people wouldn't dare go into. Uh, anyways. Okay. Thank you so much.